Thank you. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 6439 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to say so. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motion. Formally moved. Thank you very much. And no one is asked to speak against it. Therefore, the question is that motion 6439 be agreed. Sorry, 6349. Motion 6349 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item of business is consideration of motion 6357, also in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau, and this is setting out a timetable for the Railway Policing Bill at Stage 3 later this afternoon. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to say so now. I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motion. Moved. Thank you very much. No member has asked to speak against the motion. The question is that motion 6357 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And the next item of business is topical questions. Topical questions, and we start with question number one from Jamie Green. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what assistance it will provide to workers in Scotland who might lose their jobs as a result of RBS moving hundreds of jobs to India. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, officer, I want to start by saying how very concerned I am by this news from RBS and, of course, the impact it will have on staff. Uh, and I'm also extremely disappointed and perturbed by the total lack of action to stop this by the UK government, who are the majority shareholder in RBS. As soon as I heard the news, I asked my officials to speak to RBS to clarify the position and its likely impact in Scotland. We've been informed that RBS will do everything it can to support those affected, and we will look to see positive action being taken, including redeployment into new roles where that's possible. It is very unhelpful that the UK government appears to be allowing these job losses to take place and work to be transferred out with the UK purely to save costs without any consideration of the financial impact on employees and their families. The Scottish Government will do everything we can to provide support and help to those affected in Scotland by job losses through the Finance Sector Jobs Task Force and, if required, our initiative for responding to redundancy situations, the Partnership Action for Continuing Employment, PACE. Jamie Green. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary, uh, at least for some of that response. Um, I think it is also important to note the context of these losses of the total jobs being relocated to India, 59 of them will be lost in Scotland. Given that RBS employ over 10,500 people in Scotland and is quite a substantial Scottish employer, and given that it is a part publicly owned bank and has a mandate to reduce its operating costs, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what contact this Scottish Government has had with RBS concerning its restructuring to help this bank minimise any redundancies that it's had to make, whilst at the same time helping it meet its streamlining objectives? Cabinet Secretary. We have had, I would say, in response to the member's question, very good uh, discussions. In fact, it's been the feature of these that we have uh, regular meetings through different forums uh, in terms of the financial sector in Scotland, but we've also had specific uh, contact with RBS, who've been very good at advising us in advance of major developments, and of course, in RBS, there are some very substantial developments in relation to what they went through during the recession. However, there was no contact made uh, in relation to this development, which I think is very unfortunate. But just to say to the member that uh, this is a majority-owned bank, uh, majority ownership with the UK government. And we were told, of course, that we had to, in 2014, vote no to save these jobs. That was the cry from the uh, Tory party. And I think I would expect to see, certainly elsewhere, Tory uh, members of Parliament uh, raising this issue with the people that have the big decision to make here, the UK Government, and it may well be the case uh, that apart from arguing against Scotland's interest in not getting its fair share in terms of the deal with the DUP, not speaking up at all for Scotland, and now we have a situation where I expect we'll see no representations from Tory MPs to the UK Government who have a major responsibility here, so it's not so much we have a, a baker's dozen down at Westminster, we have a bulker's dozen where they do not stand up for Scotland, and perhaps if they did that, more than having a go at the Scottish Government, we could have Save these jobs. Jamie Green. Starting off, it's rather unfortunate that the Cabinet Secretary has chose, chosen to politicise this very, very important question about jobs in Scotland and what this government is doing to help people being made redundant. Still no answer to the question. Still no answer to the question. What is this government doing to help people who have been made redundant? Absolutely nothing. Moreover, this is not the first time that a large company has off, uh, offshored uh, back office uh, functions to India and other places like that. This is an ever-growing global workplace 
and the virtual services market is becoming increasingly international. So, therefore, what is this Scottish Government doing to ensure that our Scottish workforce is adequately skilled to meet the demands of a changing marketplace? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, of course, if you uh, care to check the official report, you'll see who the first was to politicise yeah. this issue, and that was Jamie Green. But also, if you check the official report, you just said that I did not answer what we intend to do. It's here in my first response. We will provide support to those affected in Scotland by job losses through the Finance Sector Jobs Task Force and, if required, uh, through the Partnership for Action for Continuing Employment. I said that in my first response. And I have to say that these responses, in particular PACE, have been extremely effective in making sure that those that lose their jobs in these circumstances can be redeployed or find new continuing employment. That's the purpose of them. So I have responded now twice uh, to Jamie Green on what the Scottish Government will do. It would be good if we had some clarity as to what the Tories will do, whether they'll raise this in Westminster or sit there, sit there meekly and accept the fate for what Jamie Green rightly says is 59 individual employees and their families. Is it not about time the Tories start to speak up for people like that? Yeah. Kenneth Gibson. Officer, uh, does the uh, Cabinet Secretary agree that after £45 billion of taxpayers' money has been spent propping up RBS, it is adding insult to injury that the UK Tory DUP government is standing idly by while 443 jobs are being shipped to India at a time when Brexit was meant to bring jobs and investment to the UK? And is he also shocked that Tory DUP MSP Jamie Green seems not to care that it's only 59 jobs from Scotland? Does he share my view that every single job lost is a job that Scotland should not lose? So just be careful about how we refer to other members in the chamber. <coughs> I would very much agree that the point that uh, Kenny Gibson makes is that every single job is absolutely critical to the individual that holds a job and usually to the families that will depend on that job. Their life chances are being uh, jeopardised by this decision. And it is possible, of course it's possible, for the majority shareholder, the UK government, to step in in this circumstance. And we'd also say that uh, rather than getting involved in Brexit and deals and bungs and whatever else, if they concentrated on the day job, keeping people in work, we'd all have a better situation in terms of employment in Scotland. Question number two, Lewis MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the Treasury regarding any additional funding for Scotland arising from the agreement between the Conservative and Democratic Unionist parties. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. I spoke with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury on the 21st of June and raised concerns about the potential financial implications for Scotland of the DUP deal that was being negotiated. I was given no detail on the negotiations and no reassurances whatsoever from the Chief Secretary of the Treasury about the potential funding impact. I followed up that conversation with a letter where I repeated my concerns about the potential implications of the deal, but I have not yet received any response. Following the announcement yesterday, the Deputy First Minister spoke to the Secretary of State for Scotland and he has agreed to take Mr Swinney's concerns to HM Treasury. I have also written today to the Chief Secretary seeking an urgent meeting to discuss this situation jointly with the Welsh Finance Minister. And I have highlighted that if this matter cannot be resolved with HM Treasury, then we will invoke formal dispute resolution proceedings to ensure that this matter is resolved. The UK Government's deal prioritises expenditure in Northern Ireland at a cost of all other parts of the UK and leaves Scotland almost £3 billion worse off than it would be if funding had been allocated using the well-established arrangements set out in the Statement of Funding Policy. Louise MacDonald. Very much, and Minister should indeed pursue any reasonable means to improve the position of our public services. It is right to test the basis for this billion pound bung and its implications for the Scottish budget. It would appear that Theresa May has agreed to bring an end to austerity in Northern Ireland, but only in order to continue imposing austerity on the rest of the United Kingdom. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that this deal demonstrates that austerity is a political choice, not an economic necessity? And if he does agree, then what new policies can we expect from the Scottish Government to end austerity here too? Cabinet Secretary. I, I actually I do agree uh, with Lewis MacDonald on the position around the alternative to austerity. And over the course of the general election in Scotland, the SNP did put forward an alternative uh, to austerity. And the UK Government has clearly overlooked that in this grubby deal with the DUP for Northern Ireland. And we don't grudge Northern Ireland a penny 
We just want fairness for every other part of the UK and not least in Scotland. And it is remarkable that the Conservatives find this a laughing matter, ripping off Scotland to the tune of £2.9 billion. That's a rip-off at the hands of the Scottish Conservatives, who seem to have lost their voice in this matter. You see, the spending areas for additional funding for Northern Ireland are devolved areas, infrastructure, health, including mental health, education, broadband, deprivation, all within the scope of Barnet. A clear breach of the statement of funding policy, undermining devolution uh, and undermining that deal that we had uh, across the devolved administrations. And that's why I've taken this issue up in the way that I have, and I'll work uh, with the Welsh uh, administration to pursue this uh, as well. And I've seen the excuse from the Conservative Party uh, that this is about uh, city deals, and that was the equivalence of Scotland. But of course, we know the reality in Scotland that this funding package uh, is an addition to city deals for Northern Ireland. So this is a rip-off for Scotland. The Tories, it didn't take them long to settle down in Westminster and sell out Scotland. Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. The Prime Minister has been fond of telling voters in Scotland, England and Wales that there is no magic money tree. There could be no increase in one budget without a cut in another. That is the sterile politics of austerity. But can the Cabinet Secretary tell us from the conversations that he and Mr Swinney have had, if there is any indication from UK government ministers which budget will be cut by a billion pounds to fund Mrs May's deal with the DUP? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the UK government have given no explanation whatsoever on how this will be funded. They certainly haven't responded uh, to my letter. They gave no explanation when I contacted the Chief Secretary to the Treasury. I do find it somewhat difficult to believe that the Chief Secretary was unaware of the details uh, of that uh, negotiation uh, when it was underway. But it looked as if uh, the rest of the UK will be paying the price, including Scotland, for this grubby deal for Northern Ireland. But, you know, they promised transparency, so let's see uh, what, uh, what figures uh, come out uh, of this and what explanation comes out of it. But in terms of transparency, we did get one piece of transparency. It feels like daylight robbery from Tory MPs who have admitted that this deal was simply about staying in government. Ivan McKee. Thank you, President Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that this May DUP deal raises serious questions for Scottish Secretary David Mundell, who said a day before this deal was announced that he wouldn't support funding which deliberately sought to subvert the Barnet rules? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I do agree with that. And he also went on to say in a separate interview, I'm not going to agree to anything that could be construed as backdoor funding to Northern Ireland. Now, as the Secretary of State, is he irrelevant? Is he irresponsible? Is he ill-informed? Or at the moment, he's incommunicado, <laughs> failing to explain his position eh, on this matter. But it is important to point out the, the breach of, of rules. It's clear in paragraph 2.15 of the Statement of Funding Policy. It says very clearly the assessment of whether a programme is unique at a UK level and thus outside the Barnet arrangements should be exceptional and that any such assessment should be evidence-based, be undertaken in a timely manner and be considered by Treasury Ministers and their counterparts in the devolved administrations oh. to ensure yeah. all viewpoints are understood before final decisions are taken. Scotland and Wales have been overlooked in this grubby deal with the DUP. Murdo Fraser. Uh, Presiding officer, if the Cabinet Secretary wants to see a grubby deal, all he has to do is look at the Green Party benches <laughs> behind him. <laughs> but, given the Scottish Government's newfound enthusiasm for the Barnet formula, can the Cabinet Secretary give me a very simple answer to this question, yes or no, will suffice. Is it still the policy of the Scottish Government to pursue full fiscal autonomy for Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. You know, SNP MSPs and SNP MPs will always, will always try and get the best deal for Scotland. And I heard Ross Thompson this morning on GMS, the new spokesperson for the Conservatives Party in absence of the Secretary of State. He was delighted with the deal he got, which was a wee nudge in the ribs of the Chancellor while selling Scotland down the river to the tune of £2.9 billion. Patrick Harvey. 
Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I say how delighted I am that Murdo Fraser is still annoyed that we reversed cuts to local government services in Scotland and cancelled and cancelled a proposed tax cut to high earners. But the, the UK government deal, the Conservative DUP deal, is clearly a breach of trust with the principle that resources are allocated according to need. In this case, it's only the need of the Prime Minister for what she needs to cling on to her job. But it undermines the ability of the UK government to be an impartial party between the, the, the different sides in the, the debate in Northern Ireland about its devolution future. Undermines also their ability to treat fairly all devolved parliaments, assemblies and governments within these islands. Does the Scottish Government agree that this must not, however, undermine the trust and solidarity between the people of Scotland and Northern Ireland, and that just as the Scottish Government has agreed that same-sex couples are entitled to come here to convert civil partnerships into marriage, so we should also ensure that women who need to access abortion from Northern Ireland are able to access the NHS on the same basis as any other citizen? Cabinet Secretary. Well, presiding officer, let me be um, generous to Patrick Harvey. He's clearly a better negotiator than all 13 Tory MPs put together. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, of course, agree with that very sensible point. Well, I actually happen to think that the peace process is also a very serious matter. And that's why I made the point that we don't begrudge Northern Ireland a penny. We just want fairness and financial justice for every part of the UK and, of course, Scotland. And in terms of that process, we do wish them well. Uh, we hope that the interventions it can be taken in the light of a constructive uh, engagement. And I say again, this is about fairness and applying the rules that we've established, not trying to disadvantage any part of the UK. Question number three, Alison Johnson to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to ensure that inpatient paediatric services are permanently available at St John's Hospital in Livingston. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. Due to concerns over maintaining a, a safe and sustainable rota for the paediatric service at St John's Hospital, NHS Lothian has reluctantly taken a decision based on a risk management assessment to implement a temporary model of service, which means that from the 7th of July it's paediatric inpatient ward will open between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Monday to Friday. The board considers that staffing levels are fragile and remain at risk, such, that, such as there may be no backup available should a member of the medical staff be absent at short notice, for example, if they fall ill. NHS Lothian has engaged with clinicians on building resilience into the rota. However, the board's position is that there is a risk of unplanned closure of the ward at short notice, causing confusion for parents and staff and possible delays to emergency care. The board chief executive, supported by the medical director, have reiterated that the decision to implement the temporary model was taken in the best interest and safety of children and their families. And NHS Lothian have confirmed that their aim is to return to a full service as soon as possible after the summer. Alison Johnson. Um, thank you. While NHS Lothian are committed to reinstating the service as soon as possible over the summer, it is not acceptable for patients and their families to be faced with an indefinite period of closure, a closure that results in increased accommodation costs, increased travel costs, additional stress. Um, what assessment has been made of the needs of those patients and their families? What assessment has been made of the impact on the Royal Hospital for sick kids in Edinburgh? Around 1,000 patients, paediatric patients, are admitted to St John's every year, and this closure will put pressure on staff in Edinburgh too. Cabinet Secretary. Well, Alison Johnson makes important points, and the actions over the, by the board over the coming weeks uh, includes uh, further engagement with the, the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health to make sure that we can get the, the service back up into a sustainable uh, uh, model. And the, uh, the involvement of staff, both uh, at St John's and indeed at the Sick Kids, is going to be very, very important as that work is taken forward. The medical director has confirmed that St John's consultants are going to have a central role in the consideration of possible solutions arrangements uh, are in hand to start this dialogue uh, as soon as possible. Um, we will also, in the Scottish Government, continue to support NHS Lothian to ensure that the services on offer at the inpatient paediatric ward remain safe and sustainable in the long term. And communication with the public uh, and parents and, uh, who are using this service is going to be a critical part of that. Alison Johnson. Um, thank you. I am concerned, I'm sure we all are, that we're not seeing increases to whole time equivalent paediatric consultant numbers. 
Um, between March 2016 and March this year, there has been a 4.2% decrease in whole time equivalent paediatric consultants. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell us when the Scottish Government intends to publish its National Health and Social Care Workforce Plan? We have been promised this. Um, we were expecting a draft National Health Care Workforce Plan by the end of 2016, with plans published this year. Um, so far, all we've had is a discussion document, and I think this issue is key to the need for such for progress in this matter. Cabinet Secretary. I can tell Alison Johnson that the workforce plan will be published tomorrow uh, and uh, I'm happy to have further engagement with her and other members around that. But what I should also tell Alison Johnson is that the model that uh, was based on the model agreed uh, with the Royal College of uh, Paediatricians and, Ch and Children's Health uh, has seen a, a total of six applicants uh, have been accepted uh, uh, to those posts. Five are now in um, post working between the sick kids and St John's because of course those were joint appointments. So progress has been made in moving forward uh, with those appointments, but that doesn't take away from the fragility uh, of the rotas over the summer. Uh, and that of course means that safety has to come first in taking this decision.